Hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode of the Horn Call podcast, the official podcast of the International Horn Society. My name is James Bolden, publications editor for the IHS and your host. Uh, As I mentioned in my last podcast, the one about the Northeast Horn Workshop, I find myself in a pretty good position as far as the podcast goes. I've recorded too many episodes for me to uh, be able to really catch up on editing all of them uh, to have them out, you know, in close proximity to when they were actually recorded. Uh, So, for instance, today's guest, Jeffrey Agrell, uh, Associate Professor of Horn at the University of Iowa, uh, I recorded that, uh, this interview with him, gosh, it was back before uh, the Christmas holiday for 2020. So um, uh, I'm recording this intro now in March of 2021. But um, needless to say, I think you're going to find uh, his uh, insight on creativity and um, uh, how to think outside of the box. I think you'll find them really informative and inspirational. I know I, every time I, I read something or uh, talk to Jeff about something, I, I find myself coming away reinvigorated and ready to tackle um, any kind of uh, problems from a fresh perspective. So um, I don't think uh, Professor Agrell needs much introduction. He's widely known in the horn world as being one of the most creative folks out there, not just in classical music and horn pedagogy, but just in terms of his overall approach to teaching music and to teaching creativity. So without further ado, here we go. So I thought, you know, we could talk about, first of all, um, you know, like like I've done this entire time with, with my guests is kind of talk about what you've been up to during this uh, strange, unusual, unprecedented, pick your cliche uh, adjective to describe the last uh, seven, eight months. <laughs> oh, boy. Um, well, uh, in this new world of Zoom that we're all living in now, um, It has made some things uh, difficult, dangerous, or impossible. Uh, But on the other hand, as the saying goes, a uh, a creative person's best friend is limitations. Uh, I'm not sure this particular limitation is our best friend, but but, um, uh, it makes us, forces us to do something different, or at least try something different. and that's sometimes really hard because nobody likes change. We are all hardwired to not like change. Mm-hmm. Um, the, that, in that deep um, reptilian part of our brain, the, uh, you know, the lizard brain just hates change. Uh, it's, it doesn't speak a language. It just, it's just something you feel when, and when change comes along. Um, everybody, and I don't care who it is, the dean or the president of the university, doesn't matter, they don't like it. Uh, they, I hear lip service all the time to creativity and innovation from the uh, august uh, institutions, <laughs> uh, and, and that it's really not true. They really don't like it. You come up with something new and they say, I'm sorry, here are all the reasons why that's not going to work and we can't do it. Uh, sorry, I'm old. I get to be sarcastic. Uh, <laughs> Uh, but anyway, so most of us, you know, we all don't like change. We don't, we all resist it in some way. Um, and that, that's probably one of the hardest things about say, when you do creative things is, uh, you, you fight the battle of, uh, it's something new. It's something I haven't done before. Uh, your first battle is with yourself trying to overcome that. Well, it's new and it's probably not any good. And who am I to do something new? Uh, and then you, of course, have to have to go against everybody else who says, "What? We didn't. We never do that. My teacher never told me that." So, um, in a way, uh, it it has the potential, at least, uh, the the whole Zoom restriction and everything else, to force us into discover something new. Uh, and I think probably everybody has done something like that because we can't do certain things. Um, and so, what, I mean, one of the obvious things uh, for you and me and everybody else is we really can't play at the same time when you're at least when you're zooming. Maybe there's other programs. So it takes a little uh, bit of uh, yeah. There's multiple software involved, and there, there's a little bit of troubleshooting if you if you're going to go that route. 
Um, <clears throat> I am not. Uh, I'm not technically adept enough to be like uh, you or James Nagus or someone else to uh, figure that out right now. So I, I've been trying to say, well, what can I do uh, if I have to do um, play only serially one person and the other person? Um, <clears throat> I actually have that game, <clears throat> excuse me, in my uh, improv book. It's called I Go, You Go. Um, and so I've had to do a lot more of that. I'm, I'm used to playing duets all the time in lessons. Uh, mm -hmm. We start off and we do improv duets, and we finish usually reading, uh, reading some sight reading duets. <clears throat> Can't do those now. Uh, so what what can we do? Um, and I've uh, some of the things I've come up with are uh, one person can just mute. And you can, now you can play at the same time. Just one person can't hear the other person. Mm -hmm. uh, so you can play duets. You just can't both hear it. But then you can do it again the second time and switch roles. And now the other person can hear. Uh, but you can play at the same time, even if one person can't hear uh, both voices. <clears throat> and one thing about duets is that you really can't hear that well both, uh, when you're both playing. Or you don't hear everything. You don't hear as well. Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> now that I'm doing more, uh, I go, you go, uh, I've actually found out that it works, uh, it works really well in a lot of situations where I'll play something and now they, they can hear it and then they play and now I hear them. I'm not, well, not while I'm playing, so I'm not doing the duet, uh, and we'll go back and forth, uh, doing that. So I actually hear better or they hear better. Uh, uh, I hear what they play. They hear you know, me modeling it or doing something first. Uh, and so that has actually turned out to be, um, I don't know, eye-opening a little bit. I'm sure I'm going to do more of mm -hmm. that kind of thing. Um, we have a lot of um, different ways to do that, a, a kind of little little games. I don't know if, um, if you or other people have played those. One is um, they're really good for oral training. Mm -hmm. I, I have a long rant, which I will try to compress, uh, <laughs> about the way institutions, music ed does oral training, which is they you, you take your oral training class and you do it on piano or voice. And there's nothing wrong with that, but they're completely missing it on our instrument. That is where we need the oral training, mm -hmm. is doing those same things on our instrument. We should be able to hear a simple melody and play it on their horn. We should be able to hear it and identify what scale degrees we're hearing like that. We should be able to remember bits of it. We're, um, I'm sorry, the rant, I'll try to keep compress the rant here, but we, we're so um, wedded to everything has to be notated that we, uh, we neglect uh, this whole side that can really improve us, which is to do a lot of things without notation. Uh, we do all of our warm-ups and all of our technical work without a notation except for maybe you look at it once to see what it is mm -hmm. possibly but we try to learn as much as possible without uh notation so that the 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 knowledge is in you and not on the page um and so you can we, that's what some of these oral games these improv games and some of these these little oral games do for instance one that's really kind of fun is to play and you can do this with zoom because you can go back and forth because mm -hmm. um, you're not playing at the same time. And you could actually do this with the whole group. Maybe I'll do it with your group when I when I get there in March. Oh, that'd be fantastic, uh, yeah. Uh, one is uh, I play, or the leader, it, couldn't, it, uh, it could be a student, doesn't have to be me, plays four beats of something, and then immediately in the next measure, everyone else, uh, one person or 100 persons, play it back. And Zoom, uh, we can all mute, the other people can all mute so you don't get um, mm -hmm. them colliding and piling on top of each other. And then what you gradually do as the leader, you make it just a little harder each time. Uh, you know, like you start off with four middle C's and that's an easy one. Everybody can do that. And then you, like, like I said, each time you can mm -hmm. make a little, and that, uh, you can get a long way in, uh, in just one session in developing everybody's ear and finding what they hear, find the notes that you hear. Uh, you could, a, a little more advanced version of that is call, um, that's kind of a call and response, but you can do it where you complete a phrase. You start a phrase, 
and then they finish the phrase. That's a little that's a little tougher. Uh, another thing we do all the time because we we start with uh, uh, overtone exercises and then we later we go on to valve exercises. And when we do the um, when we do the overtone exercises, we will do them. Um, I'll do one and then they'll do one. Just call and response. I go, you go. And when we do it in the in the the valve exercises, we do it through all keys, and we uh, we can do the same thing. Uh, if we're pressed for time, they can just do the whole thing, and I'll just listen. But otherwise, we can do. I'll do it. They'll do it. Uh, and sometimes sometimes they lead, and I I respond or they'll even choose the exercise as we go through um all keys uh okay i i no that's, that's probably I too love, way too much but uh I'll, no i love that i'll stop there no i love that and it, it occurs to me i as we were talking about this um especially at the undergraduate level and probably beyond that because i know for myself i i didn't really figure out mm, music was like it's one big universe we're not we tend to compartmentalize when especially when we're you know some some students struggle with theory they struggle with oral skills or they struggle with their lessons or, or all of the above or whatever and so in that pressure to pass the course or to keep their scholarship or whatever they they just compartmentalize and then it's only later after at least in my case it was many many years of of study and then also of teaching and seeing practically how it's all connected you know and it just it should be such an obvious thing of course ear training should be important on your instrument of course harmonic and rhythmic dictation should be important on your instrument but because we don't technically learn it except in aural skills it's it's oh okay i'm trained to hear the piano or i'm trained to hear chord progressions uh you know in in only one way <laughs> it's yeah. kind of like in math class you know you do a bunch of examples in class and then you go home and open the book and it's not like anything you did in class <laughs> yeah exactly um <clears throat> and that's uh, that's one of my other rants is the way universities are set up or at least you know advanced music education everything is they just what you said the, they split everything else up into categories and most of the time they don't have much to do with each other they are it's you you learn this over there and you learn you know there's mm -hmm. here history theory composition if you ever get any um you know the instrumental technique oral skills and they all uh, may have nothing to do with each other and that's one reason why i'm such a big fan of improv uh, i came to that very late i try to with my improv books i'm trying to save everybody you know 40 or 50 years uh, <laughs> of my bad example of never doing any uh except on guitar um because improv brings everything together because you need every bit of you can use history you can use the theory the theory is built in you oral skills that's the, the main thing about improv uh, it, and of course, learning technique and learning everything through the instrument is the main thing rather than it's over here is your oral training and then here's your instrument over here and never the twain shall meet or only peripherally not as a, a central thing. We, we uh, and that's a little micro rant here is that we we institutions, music education, any institutions. Uh, tend to do things that are easy to do and not necessarily any good. We uh, just the way the way lessons are done uh, is a is a good example, or the way that we emphasize octave scales is is a proof that you have technique. Mm -hmm. um, it, you know, pre people practice two or three octave scales. Uh, find me one piece that has a three octave scale. Find me a piece <laughs> that has a two octave scale. So why yeah. are we practicing things we are never going to encounter? In music, uh, another thing is that we get used to um, working on things that are really boring and really uh, narrow, and uh, they are never ever going to come up. Just like the octave scale uh, in music, why don't we do things that sound like music? As a matter of fact, why don't we make music? Because we, we get used to thinking that the way to make music and the way to be musical and everything is to do these sterile, boring exercises over and over. Um, and that's kind of a kind of a strange disconnect that doesn't occur to, to anybody, certainly not me for many decades. Um, why are we doing things that have really nothing to do with our final product is to be technically adept and to be make be, be able to make beautiful music. And when all of our training um, or a lot of it, the training is on sterile exercises that are 
they're not terrible, but they don't really they don't really uh, connect to music. So that is why I that's one reason why I like uh, improv, where the the person gets to make the choice and can say, all right, let's do um, I I don't need to do three active scales, but I need to do this little half a scale really well, really fast, really familiar, and in many many different ways. I um, examples what I call the power scale, one, two, three, four, five scale degrees. Mm -hmm. It contains the, the triad, the harmonic unit, one, three, five. It's like pianists. If you play piano, one of the first things you learn is those little, I don't know, I guess we call them tune-ups. It's one, two, mm -hmm. three, four, five, one, three, two, one. And there's the chord in there. Um, and so you, they're, they're already uh, way ahead of us on that. The, the problem, one of the problems with the institution is that the only thing that is valued is what somebody uh, famous, far away, and probably dead has decided is the right answer, is the thing you should learn. Uh, what the student does has no value uh, as far as creating something new. Uh, we don't want to hear it. We don't want to do it. We, we're going to count the number of uh, misses you did in your scale, and then we have an exact predictable. We have a number that we can grade you on, and then we feel good about that. We can go home. Mm -hmm. uh, even if it's, uh, and I, we don't, and uh, we don't do that now. Uh, I've started a few years ago. I wish I would have started earlier. Is my my students uh, learn their learn their scales in parts, and they use them. They learn to use them as um, in in made up little pieces. Uh, and this is also great when you're constructing your own little mini etudes to solve problems. So in the jury, everybody else, the other the other brass players, and everybody else are doing their their octave scales and my students will say, you know, they, they will give them the, it's the, uh, the scale type and then the, they will give them a key and then they say, okay, you have 30, 40 seconds, play a piece. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, yeah. yeah, the objection is, well, how can you, how do you grade something? And of course, grading is the most important thing. Uh, how do you grade something that is, uh, never been done before and, and made up? Well, actually you hear very quickly if somebody knows their way around. And it's actually, in one sense, it is more difficult because now you have to make something that sounds like a piece of music. You don't just run up and down this little scale. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, it is it ha it makes it easier because now uh, it is notes with meaning rather than memorizing a, a you know a page of the telephone book or something and then saying you know aren't I amazing I can remember that you do something as an actual story. Uh, and then it becomes easier. You think in music, you learn to think in music, and then you use the scale material, which includes the triad, uh, the harmonic unit. And um, after you've get, gotten over your initial terror of, of trying to do something, creating your own music, you go, oh, man, this is both easy and fun. And uh, wow, why didn't we do this years ago? Mm -hmm. so and like that's I the best that, kind of learning. Yeah. That's that's the learning that kind of sneaks up on you. But, you know, you, you're playing a game and you're having fun and then you don't even realize that learning is taking place. I, I think that's, you know, it's the way kids learn. Kids don't, you know, when they, when they learn to walk or they learn these basic motor skills that we take for granted, they they just kind of come at it from the standpoint of play. Uh, uh, exactly. And we no one plays their instrument in uh, higher institutions. We only serious our instruments. Yeah, or work uh, them. We, yeah. <laughs> we, we have lost the ability to play. Uh, can I read you something? I just got a new book. Please I've do. Just, yeah. I've just started it. I don't know. Uh, the name of the book I just got, it's called Cut the Knot Probabil write this down. Probability Riddles by Alexander Bogomoloni. Uh, yeah, just look for Cut the Knot. Okay. Uh, and I just saw a little blurb about it, and I started looking at it, and it looked just fascinating. And I have just started. Let's see if I can. can I, do I need my glasses for this? I probably do. Um, let me just read you the beginning of this um, because I, I found it uh, fascinating and applicable to music. Uh, it says, uh, this is in the foreword. It's actually written by somebody else. He said, how do you learn a language? There are two routes. First is to memorize imperfect verbs, grammatical rules, future versus past tenses, recite boring context-free sentences, and pass an exam. Boy, does that sound familiar. <laughs> the second approach is by going to a bar, struggling a bit, and out of need to blend in and integrate with a fun group of people, then suddenly find yourself able to communicate. 
In other words, by playing, by being alive as a human being. I personally have never seen anyone learn to speak a language properly by the first route. Also, I have never seen anyone fail to do so by the second one. Yeah, maybe just a little bit more. It says, sure. it, is, it is not a well-known fact that mathematics can also be learned by playing. Just watch the private correspondence and discussions and prayings of the members of the August Bur Burbaki circle. Some of us do not perform well on tasks via, quote, cold approaches, unable to muster the motivation to do boring things. But somehow we upregulate when, when stimulated or when there is play or money involved. This may disturb many people married to the cookie cutter pedagogical methods that require things to be drab, boring, and bureaucratic for them to be effective. But that's reality. Oh, yeah. And, you know, you were mentioning about this. Um, th it's not any one institution or any one administrator. We're not calling anybody out right. here. But right, right, it, exactly. yeah, institutionally speaking, it, it's tough to deal with creativity and innovation because it's messy. It's nonlinear. It, 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 it's, it's sometimes it's cyclical. Sometimes it's spiral shaped. I mean, it, uh, it and it doesn't. Errors and mistakes. Trial absolutely. And error. Lots of error. But that should be okay. We should be okay with that. I, I don't know how we've yeah. come to this place where if something doesn't show instant progress, it, we're, we're, we're tired of it or we want to fund something else. <laughs> yeah, the, the bean counters uh, have put restrictions on things to make it really hard to breathe sometimes uh, in the creative arts. Um and they, because they want predictability, they are not comfortable mm -hmm. when something isn't, and you don't know what's going to happen. Uh, there was, we heard whispers at one time that haven't come to pass, that they wanted to standardize exactly what what every player had to play, uh, rather than you having the freedom to choose, you know, from all of literature what your students were going to play. They mm -hmm. wanted to, the bean counter said, "Well, this is predictable. We want." Predictable is good. Predictable is the only standard for everything. Uh, and they really don't like it when there's, you know, as, as much as they talk about innovation, uh, they really want everything to be cut and dried. And the only way you can get something new and something that works uh, is is to try stuff. And most of that doesn't work. And, <laughs> but, you have, but you have to try it uh, and, and see what happens. That's why I, I try to, uh, one of the early things I do with my students is try to get them to, you have to look at mis, quote mistakes uh, in a different way because we've all been trained uh, from early on to basically flinch and tense if we miss a note. And Hey, we play the horn. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> it's going to happen. And so I say, um, uh, you know, and they, they blink and sometimes, I mean, I've seen people in auditions, they start crying literally uh, when they're, they miss some notes uh, because it's, you know, the forbidden thing to do on any instrument. Don't make a mistake. Uh, and I say a mistake is just an unpredicted result. And uh, then my have I loved to, uh, I, I guess I can't use it with your students anymore if they listen to this. Uh, my, <laughs> trick, my trick question is, what do you feel when you miss a note? And, of course, the usual answers is, you know, frustration, humiliation, disappointment, uh, the usual things. And I say, well, that's a trick question. And the answer is, what do you feel when you miss a note? And the answer is nothing, because it's not about your ego. It, it, you don't have to have an emotion, because when you play a note, whether you get it or not, it's information. Mm -hmm. So treat what happens uh, as information. And if you can use that information to then inform your next effort, uh, if you got it, good. Can you remember what you did and do it again? If you didn't get it, then <clears throat> like shooting an arrow at a target, you know, then use that information, aim higher or lower, do something different, educated guess. Uh, and if you do use the information every time, you will learn uh, much faster. So I said, uh, you don't get to scrunch up your face <clears throat> or make funny little noises when you miss a note. You, your response is always interesting. Mm -hmm. Interesting. What's the Mr. The Spock approach? Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. Do you keep the no emotion? You don't need emotion. Yeah. You don't have to have a feeling about whether you got the note or not. You say, "Hmm, what do we what do we have here?" So, uh, and that's that's also one of the barriers when people 
start improvising. I don't uh, want to improvise because I might make a mistake. Uh, even when you're, you are in charge, you're on the pick the note committee. Uh, any note you pick is good. Uh, then you listen uh, and you, then you decide on what you're going to play after that. Uh, it's hard to get over that barrier, uh, all of us, and certainly including me. Um, mm -hmm. I improvised in guitar for many decades and never on the horn until I finally got so bored on the horn that I had to do something different. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, boy, did that open up new worlds. It was like Dorothy landing in Oz. Suddenly the <laughs> world got very interesting. Now, uh, I want to I want to talk about just creativity in general. So in a, in a field that is uh, populated with a lot more creative people than maybe uh, society at large, you stand out to me as, and, and not just to me, but by you're widely recognized as a Renaissance person, uh, vastly creative, uh, just an incredibly fertile mind. Um, do you feel like that was something, again, this is kind of maybe getting into the weeds a little bit, but that's what podcasts are for. Do you feel like this was, to some extent, in, ingrained? You were born with it, or did, did you work on your creativity? Are there things, I mean, people kind of, you know, put themselves in boxes as, you know, thinking, oh, I'm not creative, or I, I'm not as talented as that person. Um, you know, when did you start to kind of figure out, oh, I, I have lots of ideas and some of these ideas could be really, really cool. And what did you do to develop your creativity? Boy, is that a great question. Uh, I think the first thing we have to tackle is the, uh, I don't know if I thought about it, but is, is it innate? Is it, a, is it a gift? Is it something you're born with? Or is it something you can learn? Um, and I think a lot of people, I don't know if it's most people would say, you just have it or you don't. I'm not very creative. I just, I've never really done anything. Um, and the, the real truth of the matter is that we are all born creative. We all start creative. Uh, everybody's creative as a kid. The hard part is keeping it when you mm -hmm. grow up, because if you ask, uh, kindergartners, who is an artist here? Every hand will go up, ask the question again when they're in the sixth grade and maybe you'll get two people raising their hands. We've already squeezed it out of them by the end of elementary school uh, because they say, no, you can't make the, the sky isn't purple and cows aren't green. You can't do that. Oh, oh, okay. Um, and, you know, and then you get probably zero hands uh, by the time they're in, you know, 10th grade or so. And I, so all the, almost all, not, not all, I mean, I'm, really generalizing here, but but most of the great majority of the, say, the people I see as freshmen coming in have, have seemed to have had a creative lobotomy uh, because they uh, that's the way they've always been taught. You're not creative. Everything of value comes from far away. It doesn't come from you. Uh, in general, we have a creative art without creativity, music, the way music is done in the, in the uh, institutions. Yeah, uh, art. If you if if they did that in art classes, you'd only paint the Mona Lisa again. Uh, <laughs> it's just, absurd right? when you think about it that way, isn't it? Yeah, uh, is it, you know, uh, it, but they you know, art people paint original paintings and things. They they sculpt and, and things. Uh, English people will uh, English majors will write essays and poems and things like that. Even theater people who have to memorize plays written by somebody else, they also learn to write plays and they learn how to do improvisation, theatrical mm -hmm. improv. Dancers choreograph. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, so in all of the other arts, they have they have it built in. But uh, music we are in the institutional music is, is entirely recreative. And boy, are we good at that. Holy mackerel. We have developed that to a fine degree, mm -hmm. reading off the paper. But we have, we have systematically... Uh, if unconsciously kept it out of, of the program. And that's a huge pity. It's a huge tragedy because I, I think of it like, think of a large, a huge house or a mansion. Half of it is, is, our, is what we call the literate side of music, <clears throat> where you only read off paper and you read from somebody else's composed. The other half is the oral creative side of music, which was what music has always been for the last 50,000 years, up until uh, about 200 years ago. Uh, and that is where everybody 
has a voice, just like your speaking voice, and you can create something. You can. Mm -hmm. um, the doors aren't closed between the two. You just never go in there because no one has ever told you you could. Or you, if you walk there and say, no, 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 we live in this part of the house. Um, and it, it's, it is incredibly fun and enriching and everything else. It allows for mistakes. It allows for a unique personal voice. Um, in, in the, our literate side, we're trying to be, uh, sound like everybody else. We're trying to be, we're taught to be replaceable, identical cogs. So you can move, take one out, put somebody else in, they can do exactly the same thing. They should sound like the, like the other people that are already there. Um, and the extreme thing, you've got to even play the same horn as somebody else that's already there. That's, that's become a little less than it used to be. Thank goodness. Uh, and the other side, um, with, and they are not mutually exclusive. You can we, <laughs> you can do both. Uh, you try to have a, you find out what you what is your voice? What is your individual voice? Uh, and we are we don't know how to do that. We're terrified of doing that. Um, I don't know. I I but I didn't do it either for a very long time on horn. Um, I did it on other ways. I did it on guitar. I did it mm -hmm. on writing. I did it on composing where I had a voice and it wasn't until I actually started teaching at Iowa 21 years ago that I was, I was just so bored with horn thing. I had to come up with something. So I put together, I forced together the, uh, my improv from guitar onto my horn activities. And uh, I was terrified, absolutely terrified. Uh, I was afraid of mistakes and everything else, but I, I was, you know, we don't change unless we're forced to. And I was, uh, forced to by my boredom and my bad attitude uh, to try something new. And it, it, like I said, it opened up new worlds. Uh, so what I, I try to give all my students, uh, kicking and screaming at first, but uh, uh, an introduction to this world where they have a voice uh, and we uh, just learn to make up stuff the same way that you, you have a conversation with people, the same where we're making up stuff talking back and forth um well it's mostly me i apologize for that no I, this uh, is that's the point of this podcast but if the, if you want to uh, if you want to get a start uh, i mean you of course could buy my book improvisation games for class musician but you don't have to you can start anybody can start um just by making your own choices play one note play one note play it as long as you until you feel really safe you're not so worried about and then when you're so bored then play another note and you go well i didn't die hmm interesting <laughs> uh and then you and then you keep going uh or turn on the turn on spotify play along with anything you hear you know you can do it in a dark room so nobody actually hears you you're still afraid of that um and you can you can use this in anything you do you can use it to compose your own little series of micro etudes it's all problems uh, you can do this with somebody else. My, my horn students kind of drive some of the other band people nuts because they will be poor band. They'll, they'll make up duets and, and trios and quartets just on the spot. And everybody else says, how, how do you do that? <laughs> uh, they said, oh, it's just magic. You know, just, <laughs> it's something you can do. and it's anybody can do this. Uh, it's just that we have been kept away from it by the process. I have, you have, everybody has, uh, unless you've been really lucky uh along the way um but it's it's there it's easy it's cheap doesn't cost anything unless you buy my book of course um and anyway it's uh and it's fun i know you're not supposed to have fun music is serious no having fun <laughs> uh i was reprimanded in a in a dissertation defense once for using the word fun no you can say motivating or engaging but do not say fun Oh my! Anyway, wow. uh, there's there's a great book if you want to get into creation in general. Uh, there's there's a wonderful book called Thinker Toys by Thinker Toys. Michael Michael Michalko. Uh, and just uh, speaking of, of you can uh, you said is it innate or is it a process? It is a process that anyone can learn. Uh, and this is this is the day and age where, uh, and I also say. Uh, what we're trying to, what the what the tradition of the institution has been is doing the same thing. Everybody does the same thing. Everybody mm -hmm. has the same kind of lesson. You do solo, etudes, excerpts, you learn your scales and all that. So we're all 
training to be the same replaceable cogs in in one sense um and not not really doing anything uh different there um uh, what uh, in this day and age it really helps to be different in a way uh do you know seth godin yes yeah seth godin? yeah uh, he is he is uh, he is a marketing expert. And he's got like twenty books. They're all a little short, and chapters are about two pages. And uh, but he's a he is a real guru in that. It all applies very well to music. What his message is, and he said there's two ways you can be a success in this day and age. And he's I mean he's talking about everything, but it applies to music. He says one is to be the best person in the world at what you do, and. Uh, only one person is that, and that's not you. All right, it's it's somebody else. You know, probably mm-hmm. Frank Lloyd, but who knows? <laughs> um, anyway, uh, and he said the other way, the other solution is to uh, find something that only you can do. That that because everybody's has unique experiences. You know, and you take in, into account your whole life and things that you like. Um, and then you can you can come up with something that that nobody else can really do the way you do it. Find a niche, then you own this territory. Uh, and he said that is going what is going to be your key to surviving and thriving in this new scary millennium. Mm-hmm. And you be you like be that. the linchpin, yeah. yeah. Linchpin is one of his books. Uh, the Purple Cow is probably a great way to start. Uh, he said he was in France driving in, in a train the first time and he saw a cow and another cow and lots of cows. And they were all brown. He said, I didn't know one from another. But if I saw a purple cow, uh, I would remember that cow that mm-hmm. way. So he says, find a way to be purple. Be the purple cow. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, the what the other book I mentioned, uh, Thinker Toys by Michael Michalko, is uh, a, a, there's a wonderful um, chapter called Scamper. It's an acronym. I mean, he has a whole book full of it, but the one I use more than anything is is Scamper. And each one stands for a way that you can generate in 10 minutes more ideas than you can figure out in 10 years. S is for substitute. Take some part of your process or your product and replace Mm -hmm. it with something else. Uh, Crazy is good. If it wasn't crazy, somebody would have thought it already. You know, uh, and, you, you know, you have a bicycle, replace the tires with jet engines. Mm-hmm. Uh, and a lot of it's going to be crazy, but it will provide you a stepping stone to something you can actually do. So it's substitute, combine. Mm. Uh, combine is you combine two things that have nothing to do with each other and let those characteristics mix. And that will produce something brand new uh, with C-A-M, adapt, adapt something that already exists to do something else. Uh, scan S C A M modify minify um, uh, or maybe even uh, so make it different in some way like take some part of it and blow it way up what would happen if you do that or modify one part of it to do something else uh, scan P put to another use make it do something that it wasn't intended to do E take something away from it and what do you have uh, I Oh, I don't know if you young people have ever remembered that phones used to have a cord. Uh, <laughs> and somebody said, what if we take the cord away? And you said, and people will say, okay, you're crazy. We can't have a phone without a cord. How is the electricity getting in and the data getting out? You've got to have a cord. You said, no, no, let's, let's, let's run with this a little bit. Eliminate the cord. And they said, oh, you're crazy. That's never going to happen. Well, who has a phone with a cord now except for, you know, putting in, uh, recharging it now they have the recharging plates you don't even need a cord mm-hmm. okay and then the last one R is retrograde um, that do try everything backwards from the way you do it mm. uh, if you do it if you do it during the day what happens if you do it at the night if you start on the left side what happens if you start on the right side what if you turn it upside down uh, whatever it is and a lot of what you come up with of course with all these will be crazy and make no sense and be silly and make may probably make you laugh but this is how you arrive at something new that no one has thought of mm-hmm. uh, that uh, that scamper like that and there'll uh, be some gold in there there'll there'll be some things that don't work but then they'll you're looking for the that thing that is is going to work or the idea that's going to catch hold absolutely uh and so what i <clears throat> what i do with my students uh and i say i want you to ask um, what if, 
or why a lot. Uh, all the stuff we do, all the stuff you've learned before me and the stuff that we do me, uh, we do together. I want you to say, why am I doing this? Uh, and that's what I finally arrived at back when I started teaching was, why am I doing all the things that are boring me, my socks off right now? What What's the point? Mm -hmm. What am I getting? Just because somebody told you to do it or was printed in a book, that's not good enough to say that's why I'm doing it because famous person said it worked for them. Uh, you say, what, what do I get out of that? I mean, and then is there another, then follow that up with, is there another way to, to get the same thing? If only for variety. Um, mm -hmm. There's you know, vitamin C, you can get that from oranges, but there's a lot of other ways you can get vitamin C. It doesn't have to be the same damn thing every time. Uh, and then same thing with all the things that we do. Uh, is there another way? to to learn that is there is there a better way or what's what's missing uh i find this really difficult what can i do to make that easier so what what is there other steps i could i could build to achieve that uh and then what if what if you you know all like what if all the scamper things what mm -hmm. if we combine this with that what if i uh and so you can generate a lot of uh, and these are just procedures that anybody can do everybody should do but none of us were taught to do that. Uh, we were all uh, taught by the, the, the one paradigm. I, I actually wrote a, a chapter in my book, The Creative Hornets. There's a chapter in there called The um, New Chicago, Old Chicago, The, the Paradigm of Lessons, how what mm -hmm. we're doing. We, we treat lessons as a way to make everyone the new principal in Chicago symphony, just mm -hmm. to you know, pick, pick a name. Uh, what, if we, uh, what if we did it? didn't do that what would what would what would the answer be there and i what happened to me there is i had a i had a young student who started in sixth grade and we went through there and he had terrible bad habits that he would not let go of so i i finally almost gave up he he was frustrated i was frustrated so i said all right what if we just try to make it fun mm -hmm. and interesting and we just kind of abandoned the, the idea that i'm trying to put him through you know i did i did the same thing you know let's sell those excerpts etudes you know um, exercises so we just started having fun and, and all right all right we, let's do let's do d flat minor but only three notes uh and i'll be the dragon and you be the choo-choo train here we go mm -hmm. uh and make it up um and then as it went along i had him for six or seven years and he he was also a piano player and he started got into jazz uh, and i i play jazz guitar so that helped me that was one of the things that helped me more than anything was learning jazz because the way music theory is taught in institutions, it's wonderful for theorists. It's pretty useless for, as far as I can see, for classical players because you don't really understand anything about music. You just see, okay, we've labeled the parts of what famous composer did. Right. But it's, it's like diagramming it, a sentence. Yeah. It, yeah. It's it's how very nice for the uh, the people <laughs> that do that stuff. But what jazz does is it makes it everything useful. It's an easy way to think of scales and arpeggios and identify them, have names for them, understand them. And then, of course, uh, you don't have to be a jazz player. I'm not a jazz horn player. I can't do that. I do some on uh, guitar. But uh, uh, it's a great way to understand uh, music and make it useful to uh to understand what you're doing especially if you're making stuff up you can say all right i'm in this scale on this chord what if i move to this one anyway uh, mm -hmm. all right way yeah. too much uh, oh no this, back, this is all good <laughs> no do, do you ever get writer's block and if uh, or, or creative blocks and if, if so do you how do you you mentioned the scamper method which i think you know that that makes that makes a lot of sense i'm gonna have to put that into play when i when i hit a wall with something i'm working <laughs> on but uh well I'm, I'm really lazy. I am one of the laziest people I know. Uh, I will, I'm, I'm giving myself a break by, by calling it creative procrastination. Um, I will, I will put things off for a long time when I should just, you know, apply butt to chair and just get on with it. And I'll think about it. Uh, then when I finally, the only good thing is when I finally s sit down and, and do it, it, it actually goes pretty fast. Uh, because I thought about it for a long time and, you know, kind of turned it over and everything else. I'm not, I'm not sure that's the best way. It's just the way I, you know, my lazy way of finally settling down. I, I make lists and I write down ideas and stuff, but it, it takes me a long time 
to finally settle down and unless there's well there was one thing that happened um that compressed it a little bit um about four years ago i'm not sure you know do you know you know ricardo maracinos yeah yeah uh he's amazing he won the uh twin cities horn club composition contest and i found that i said hey do you want to come down to you know run down to iowa not too far mm -hmm. and you know uh play and and give a master class and stuff and he did and he was he was absolutely wonderful and after we got done we uh, i said hey why don't you write a piece for for the group and a couple months later there it was showed up in the doorstep uh and he said he's well at the time he said sure i will but you got to write one for me <laughs> uh and I, I, I said yeah sure easy easy to easy to say uh, so then a couple of years went by uh and then a year ago he said well <laughs> I, I said well what and he said where's my piece and i went what pe oh oh and he said i said um okay i said what do you want and he said i want a piece for low horn and piano he said i'm i'm doing my doctoral one of my doctoral recitals and i want to play it on that forced me to sit down and think about it. And so I came off with a piece called Gollum Offrey Suite for Low Horn Pan. Did I send that to you? Yeah, I've got it. Yeah, it's it's in my okay. stack. Of, it's on my to-do list for sure. Okay. <laughs> I, uh, you mentioned list. I've got a running list of pieces I need to program <laughs> at, at some point. Anyway, he, he did a performance of it. It's on YouTube if anybody's interested. I'm uh, And I think it was, I think it worked out pretty well. Uh, I, as Duke Ellington used to say, I don't need more time. I need more deadlines. Yeah, <laughs> uh, deadline deadlines are really good. Um, uh, by the way, the the pieces I, I'm not selling it yet in the foreseeable future, but I will give it for free to anybody who's bought uh, either my horn technique or my creative hornist book. Um, <clears throat> yeah. Uh, so anyway, deadline deadlines are good. I have a uh, one of them. They're like they're like kind of like this train moving at you, you know, and you, you're getting closer and closer, and you've got to do something before it hits you. Mm -hmm. Uh, I've got to write a piece. Uh, our oboe professor asked me to write a piece for oboe and piano, so that has been ricocheting around my brain, uh, destroying some of my sleep lately. Uh, trying to think what I'm going to do. I've got to write that over the break now. Uh, I also have uh, I don't know seven other books that are waiting to be. Uh, done. I can't describe them in too much detail because uh, it, they're all very easy for somebody else to do. Uh, one... <laughs> I don't know about that, Jeff. I think uh, <laughs> you you think of more ideas in about thirty minutes than most people do in you know six months. Uh, well, they don't. That's that's because uh, I sh I shouldn't even talk about it because as, as soon as everybody finds out that they are all, are all creative, uh, there you know, there are so many people that are you know so much better than me at almost everything that it will be, uh, we could be inundated with all those voices let loose on, with their creativity. Anyway, I have I have one new, you, you may be familiar with my Millennium Coprosh series. Mm -hmm. uh, I have one, I got an idea the other day for a new one. So if I'm lucky, I'll try to grind that out during the break as well. Um, I have a I have an idea for a series of four student method books where I kind of break down my uh, uh, horn improv, horn technique book into mm -hmm. uh, four groups for the student. The horn technique book is for the teacher, not for students. Uh, and then I have another uh, another book is going to be for all classical musicians. Um, that's I, uh, not sure when I'm going to get to that. And then I have an, another idea for a book, which is taking uh, four horn players on just this whole oral creative approach. I, some of that is already in my Creative Hornets book, but I want this to be more of a practical mm -hmm. workbook kind of thing. Uh, so I have plenty of you know, this ideas stacked up like planes over O'Hare. Uh, you know, when I get to them, that's a factor of my uh, lazy procrastination kind of thing. <laughs> and the deadline pressures and so you know we'll, you know how in the princess bride where he says you keep using that word i don't think it means what you think it means that's i, I think lazy is i don't think i don't think it means what you think it means <laughs> uh, i i put it off as long as i can and, and finally i realize that i'm not going to get any sleep until this you finally get the damn thing out of you and you go oh, okay that's done but uh 
yeah, it feels really good when you you finally yeah, you know get that that little nagging little little thing that's been running around your your brain like a like an otter in a tank, you know, and finally you you pin it down and get it done. Um, no, that's, uh, that's fantastic. Yeah. Well, it, and thank you so much. I, you know, I think we could probably continue this conversation for, for many, many more hours, but I don't want to keep you too much from your many, many <laughs> books that you're working on. But I, I guess just to kind of wrap things up, is there anything, you know, this being the International Horn Society podcast, you, you've got a long history with them. Uh, you've been on the advisory council. You've, I, I don't know how much copy you've contributed, uh, uh, you know, the exact number, but it's it's got to be in the hundreds or thousands of pages to the horn call over the, the years. Um, you know, if you could mention a few things about the importance of the IHS that maybe people just uh, just kind of need to hear at this point when there's so many other things that so many other, you know, organizations or, or causes they could support. What what are some reasons that, that you could think of that people might uh, use to join the International Horn Society? Well, one, uh, especially in this time of pandemic where, you're, where we are all isolated, uh, is that you are not alone and it's a way to connect to your other uh, other horn players all over the world and to uh, of course as a as a resource it's unbelievable all the, the stuff there I use it almost every day uh, in various ways the website um, and I I, I, I think it, it it does and it also has even further potential for bringing us together we need we need to have ways to share and to come together and to talk to each other uh and i well i'm of course interested in that little part that w which is to encourage people to create their own music and uh, share that music to have a voice uh, even if you never want to uh, publish or anything else uh uh to to experience you what you what you feel what you can do and put it all together and have a voice uh and i think people most people will be amazed at what they can come up with very quickly i i'm always even though i've been doing this for years i'm always amazed at what my students come up with that i didn't expect they they have now they've kind of taken over and they don't even ask me anymore they just put a an improv piece of some sort in their recital and oh okay um, but everybody can do it, and I would I love to see that part develop more. But the the there is nothing like the Horn Society. We were the first society, first instrumental society, uh, and I I think we, there's so many good people. Uh, and there it just can do so much so much good in so many ways. I think the Horn Society is just uh, an irreplaceable uh, institution for every horn player. Oh, well, thank you so much. And I, I really appreciate that. And uh, maybe we should end it there for today. But uh, okay. thanks again for, for speaking with me, Jeff. My pleasure. Thanks for putting up with me. <laughs>